So we've talked a little bit about all the different therapeutic agents, and clearly, you know, Dr. Quinn, as you talked about, so traditionally, heretofore, we've always just had in intravenous cytotoxic chemotherapy. Now we've had a whole slew of agents. There's more data coming out now with the with the recent uh, with the recent Affirm trial that that shows. Uh, uh, basically that a lot of these oral agents uh, are going to be used before chemotherapy. So the one that, that has approval in both the pre-chemotherapy and the post-chemotherapy space has been abiraterone or Zytiga. So there's been lots of, lots of discussion, um, obviously very easy drug to use, I think. However, because of its particular mechanism of action, uh, there is a requirement for a certain degree of, of steroid use. Can you comment a little bit about 30, Cougar 301, 302, a uh, little bit about your experience with the drug so far? Sure. Well, the Cougar 301 study uh, showed how powerful this drug was. So this is in patients that had had docetaxel, and it showed a very distinct overall survival advantage and very good disease control with minimal side effects in a very sick population. These were, these were people accrued literally at the end and their overall survival uh, in the treatment arm extended beyond a year. It's sort of going back to where we started in castration-resistant prostate cancer, but with a much better side effect profile. The Cougar 302 study was in the pre uh population, and it demonstrated that the control of disease with, with abiraterone, acetate, and prednisone uh, was very long-term. Uh, the patients, on average, uh, were being treated out to 16 and 18 months, so a long time on therapy, and it showed a very strong trend to overall survival, and the FDA looked at the data and said, you showed us the drug worked after docetaxel, this is an earlier population, we think it's all consistent, and there were no new safety signals. Uh, that said, there are some, there are some issues with, with using the drug that I think are important. And when we initially worked on abiraterone, uh, the, the two problems that became apparent were hypertension and increased potassium. And this was due to a, 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 a feedback loop into the aldosterone mechanism uh, in the adrenal gland. Uh, and in order to abrogate that, we needed to block it. The easiest way to block it with the most common, cheapest drug is actually with steroid. Uh, and so the indication for abiraterone is with prednisone for that reason. Now, when you treat patients for a long time, they get toxicity from, uh, from prednisone, even at, even at 10 milligrams. And so what many of us do, uh, and this is not in the label, but uh, I, after a patient's stable on therapy and their blood pressure and potassium are okay in the clinic, uh, I'll start to reduce them, uh, usually reducing by about 25 or 50 percent uh, each, each month that I see them. Uh, and there are many patients that you can actually get off prednisone. You still need to monitor them. Um, and virtually every patient we can get down to five milligrams or below. And so the Cushingoid sort of uh, side effects that we used to see are minimized. And also the, the other issue here is that the newer agents are very powerful blockers of the androgen receptor biosynthesis in bone. If you combine that with steroid, you've got a recipe for osteoporotic fractures down the line. So minimize the steroid uh, as much as you can. And also remember calcium, vitamin D, and either denosumab or, or zoledronic acid. Uh, many urology practice the subcutaneous use of denosumab is easier. So this is now in the urologist's hands. And I think uh, we're seeing a powerful drug and it alters the projections uh, uh, lo looking uh, onwards where many of these patients are living beyond three years now. Before, we, we would sort of say, okay, well, our treatment is for, day, for today. We're gonna palliate symptoms uh, and we may extend survival a bit with docetaxel. Now we have the extension of survival and we have to look after the comorbidities that we can produce. And in terms of management of abiraterone, um, initially there's a little bit of gastrointestinal uh, uh, upset in some patients, but that usually is gone within a few weeks uh, and uh, doesn't usually uh, require specific uh, therapy. Some people do have difficulty taking the drug on an empty stomach and I, I actually get them to, to split it up and, and uh, they can take it with food. Uh, it will not produce a decreased absorption of the drug and you can usually get them through that and then I try and get them back onto the empty stomach uh, routine first thing in the morning.
I know that initially when you start a person on abiraterone, you're supposed to check liver functions every couple of weeks for a few months. When you have them pass two, three months, how often are you following their lab values? So if, if they what I do is I see them at two weeks and do their liver enzymes, potassium, measure the blood pressure, just have a look. Uh, and then I'll, I'll do four weekly for probably the first, uh, uh, first three or four months. And then after that, when my patients are, are out at six months and they're stable, uh, they don't want to come and see me. Uh, and, you know, they'll usually be getting some form of LHRH therapy. So uh, we end up doing it every three months. Many of my patients travel. Uh, and they, they don't want to come. Uh, so they're, they're pretty stable. Uh, once we get beyond the six month mark, I'm, I'm comfortable not to check their potassium uh, and provided they're feeling well and there are no interval symptoms uh, for them to come back every three months. So the other oral agent that's out there obviously is, the, is, the, is, is enzalutamide, which is an androgen receptor signaling inhibitor. So the, so the um, their, their initial PREVAIL trial was in the post-chemotherapeutic space, correct? Um, actually, the post-chemotherapy uh, affir yeah, post trial was, was AFFIRM. Was AFFIRM. And then, then we, have some, we have a press release on PREVAIL, which was in the PRE space. So uh, enzalutamide uh, proved a very active compared to placebo uh, after docetaxel. And uh, that's currently where it's licensed with the FDA. Uh, in just the last week or so, we've had a press release on the PREVAIL trial, which was the pre-docetaxel trial of enzalutamide given uh, compared to placebo. And it showed, a, uh, based on the press release, uh, a more than 80% reduction in progression over the time course of the trial. And this is not PSA progression, it's actually radiologic uh, progression was that endpoint. It also showed a very significant hazard ratio of benefit for overall survival, uh, but uh, interestingly, the medians were, were uh, b both beyond 30 months in both uh, of the of the arms, uh, placebo and enzalutamide, but only about a two month difference. And so, we haven't seen the data. It'll it'll be at meetings that are coming up uh, in 2014, uh, and the shape of that overall survival curve looks to be significant. This is only the first report of the first interim analysis. So. Uh, the effect on overall survival looks to be uh, significant, at least based on the hazard ratio, uh, with a very major effect. And we're going to have to make a choice between two really powerful drugs, and I don't know the answer of which one I'm going to choose. So I want to thank uh, our exceptional panel today. I think this has been a very stimulating and thought-provoking discussion, and, uh, but really what I want is some final, from final thoughts from each one of you in terms of some take-home messages for this ever exciting, burgeoning field of management of advanced prostate cancer. So, Dr. Albala? Well, I think uh, for me the take home message has been there has been significant change that's taken place in the last few years. You know, these patients, um, the treatments were reasonably set. We got into a routine and now in the, in the last couple of years between immunotherapy, the new medications, the radionuclides that have come out. This is a, a changing field that as urologists, we need to, to stay abreast of these changes, understand the drugs, understand you know how the sequencing should be with these drugs. And I think that we're still learning that. And uh, it's an exciting time for us. And I think that, that we will get more experience and hopefully make significant differences for our patients. Dr. Crawford? Well, I, I echo what uh, Dave says. There's, uh, this is an exciting time. I've not been this excited for a number of years in prostate cancer. We've got seven new drugs that's, that have different mechanisms of action, immunotherapy, things that alter testosterone, even a new chemotherapy agent, bone protective agents, um, and radionucleotides. So now we've got a lot of tools to work with. And it used to be what, you know, that that we had advanced prostate cancer, we would treat people and then they would sort of be circling the drain and we would, you know, give them uh, chemotherapy. And, and you know, it was, it was kind of the, the rationale that, you know, the patient needs a life preserver, not a swimming lesson. Well, you know what? Right now, we, we're moving up for, uh, earlier, so the swimming lesson is there. And we need lessons, too, on how to put these things together. And uh, so it's an exciting time. And, and I'm really optimistic that 
that we're going to convert some of these, and we're already seeing this into a chronic disease. We're not going to cure it like diabetes, heart disease, but you know, actually have the patient die of something else, not toxicity from the drugs either. Right. Steve? I think the final word that jumps into my head is complementary. I think as a radiation oncologist on this panel, I think it's clear to me that by working closely and together with radiation oncologists, urologists, medical oncologists, radiologists, we, we do better service for our patients. I also think that with all of these new agents coming down the pike, how they work together will be complementary, and some may be more useful for other for certain specialties to be excited about. But I think as we work in multidisciplinary groups together, we're really going to help our patients. Ben, I think the days of the urologist tapping the patient on the shoulder uh, who is on ADT with a rising PSA and is asymptomatic are thankfully long gone. And I think uh, as we move forward, it's imperative that urologists understand how these therapies work incorporate them into the practice because if you don't do it or even if you don't refer your patients for, for therapy in this space, I think you're doing a disservice. And at, at the end of the day, it's what, what is the most important is the, the, the patient's life and also their quality of life. And I think that that needs to be paramount. Steve? Uh, to me, the, the kind of final two things would be risk stratification and a holistic approach. And this starts from day one. We talked a lot about active surveillance for low risk disease. And by the same token, pedal to the metal, full kitchen sink for the high-risk disease. And that starts early with early imaging and multiple agents now for the advanced stage disease and likewise not aggressive treatment for the low risk. And really at every stage teasing that out and not forgetting that the vast majority of our patients, and now we are seeing this even in the metastatic castrate resistant disease setting, are dying of causes other than prostate cancer. So we need to make sure they're not dying from toxicity of our drugs and keeping you know, our minds that we're still doctors. We're not prostate cancer doctors, we're doctors. David? So, so I think for the prostate cancer patient, the newer drugs in, in recent years have meant that it's game on, not game over. And it gives us a lot of options. For those of us that are treating the patients, it's also game on and not game over. We need to learn how to use these therapies uh, and how to put them together if that's appropriate. And I think there's a lot of hope there both for patients and also for those of us who've been treating this disease for some time, uh, where we've been reorganising the deck chairs. Uh, now, now we actually get to uh, see the patients uh, prosper and live longer and, and do well, and hopefully we can do even better. Well, gentlemen, I really, I really thank you for your time and uh, your expertise and your intellectual properties. And on behalf of our panel, we thank you for joining us and hope you found our peer exchange uh, hopefully very informative and, and useful for your clinical practice.